Hi, everyone. Um, so this is the, f the third and last lecture. And um, in today's talk, I'd like to cover uh, two items. One is uh, the item that we began last time, which is the second proof for the result on a cutoff for random regular graphs, the one that uses a spectral analysis. And that's the one that's going to also carry to settings where we don't have randomness. So um, remember that uh, diagram that we had at the beginning where we had um, the, the, the first proof that used, that heavily relied on the randomness of the graph and, uh, and on regularity. Then we'll have a second proof that will not rely on randomness anymore, but rather on, on the spectral properties of that, that, that we uh, uh, un understand very well on a uh, on random regular graph, but still uses uh, regularity very uh, crucially. And then in the, in the second part of today's talk, I'll uh, address what happens when you don't have a regular graph. Let's say a random, uh, it's random, but now let's say half, degree, half of the degrees are three and half are four. Okay, or, uh, and then, then things are different. Okay, so, uh, so also because this is the last lecture and last time, last time we took things, uh, we did things very slowly and carefully, but we only have this one last lecture to go. So today I'll try to give you the outline of arguments instead of spelling everything out. Um, but feel free to uh, come, come along in the break if you want to see the details of, uh, of various uh, statements. Okay, so um, I'm gonna, as I promised yesterday, we, d we said a few things very quickly towards the end of, uh, of the lecture. I wanna just uh, mention them a little more, uh, um, a little more formally. So here's a, a proposition. So for p equals 2, okay, so I'll, I'll remind you first of all, um, what is it that we're after? Well, uh, this, um, this picture above, uh, uh, I'm going to shut the lights when, when we get to it uh, very, very soon, but this picture above is a Ramanujan graph, and you might not uh, remember what that is, but a Ramanujan graph is a graph where the bound that you have on all the non-trivial eigenvalues is essentially the best one possible. So you want to take your adjacency matrix before you divide it by the internet into a transition kernel of a simple random walk, just take your adjacency matrix and, and, and want to somehow confine all the eigenvalues into the smallest possible interval uh, around zero that you can in magnitude. And it turns out that 2 square root d minus 1 is the magic number. You can't do any better than that. Okay? So if you have any sequence of graphs, uh, d regular graphs going to infinity, um, then you can, you can say that the absolute value of lambda is going to be 2 root d minus 1 minus constant over the diameter. And this is what um, Charles was uh, referring to as the alon bopana theorem, and he had that discussed that theorem in more general context yesterday and in this course uh, in general this week. So 2 root d minus 1 is the best possible one. And if it so happens that all the eigenvalues satisfy that they are at most, except the first one, they are at most this, uh, this number in magnitude, then, but really this number, not plus some epsilon plus it of, uh, of one error, really at most this number, then you call the graph a Ramanujan graph. That's all. Okay, so... Um, if you'd like to think of it uh, differently, it's a deregular graph where the spectral gap, the, a the absolute spectral gap, so you also take the, the most negative uh, eigenvalue in mind, uh, for instance, is the best possible one. And, um, and, and as we uh, saw from, uh, from Charles' to uh, talks, uh, G and D, the random deregular graph, is almost Ramanujan. It's weakly Ramanujan. It's, um, it's 2 root d minus 1 plus a little of 1 error, and there are uh, precise and actually fascinating uh, conjectures for the distribution of the second uh, largest eigenvalue, and in particular, uh, it is believed that with uniformly bounded away from 0 and 1 probability, a random deregular graph will be Ramanujan. Okay, but, so with probability, I don't know, 2 thirds. But, um, 
that is far from, uh, from the present technology's uh, abilities to prove it. Um, okay, there are some, uh, some, some various, uh, there are various uh, constructions, randomized and non-randomized, um, uh, for Ramanujan graphs. And, um, and, and in order to deal with this object, um, <coughs> as I mentioned uh, yesterday, that's what, that, that's what I, I was getting to here, you have a, a random graph, and, and suppose that I tell you, well, forget about the random graph, you, you, you just want to use the fact that you have some information about the spectrum, and you want to uh, exploit that in order to control the L1 mixing time. So the first thing that one would try would be to say, uh, I don't know about L1 mixing, but L2 is tightly related to the eigenvalues. I mean, if you knew the eigenfunctions as well, then it's an equality. So let's, uh, let's see what we can do with the eigenvalues, and maybe L2 will bound us L1. With some luck, it's going to be uh, a, tight, a, a tight bound, a bound that we can realize using a lower bound on L1, and then we're done. This is, uh, this is the way many, many uh, proofs for, uh, for L1 cutoff uh, actually uh, were obtained. So we're using precise representations, complete representations of all the eigenfunctions and all the eigenvectors going through L2 to bound L1 and, uh, and providing some, um, uh, some uh, bound uh, that, that, that matched uh, using uh, uh, some elementary arguments. Okay, so for, uh, for P equals 2, what can we say? I'll, I'll write the, uh, the definition of, of what we mean by, um, by the distance according to, L, to LP norm. So this would be just starting from some point x. You can just say that this is just uh, you're, you're measuring yourself, you're measuring the, the relative density with respect to pi or stationary distribution, p is as usual the transition kernel, and you're measuring it with respect to, maybe this is written in small font, with respect to LP. Okay, so this is the, the, the distance according to LP at time t, and as usual, we'll say that t mix according to LP to within epsilon is the minimum t such that b t dp without any x is at most epsilon over t, where this guy is the worst case, the worst case dp, so the worst starting position. This is the standard definition. If you plug in p equals 1, then integrating over pi cancels this pi and multiplies uh, minus pi here, and you get just the L1, okay? Or, or equivalently twice the total variation mixing. So L1 is essentially, a, so total variation distance is the case p equals 1, and we're just going to use uh, the p equals 2 to bound the p equals 1 case, ideally. So here's the proposition. For every epsilon larger than 0, so on G, it is G and D. Simple random walk with high probability has, so for every epsilon larger than zero, you know that T mix of L2 of epsilon is equal to one half plus little of one log. <coughs> Well, rho is this magic <coughs> number from above. I mean, it's, it's the, the, the bound that we have on the eigenvalues divided by d, to ten, because, because this is a normalization to make the adjacency matrix into a transition kernel for, for simple random walk. Okay? And, um, and what I mentioned yesterday very quickly is that, that this inequality, so just, just a lower bound, so this, as a lower bound, applies to any deregular <laughs> graph. Okay, any deregular graph. So, um, so, so, 
So in general, so generally, you can say that T mix in LP for P that is between <coughs> 2 and infinity, T mix of epsilon will always be at least uh, P minus 1 over P log 1 over rho n minus some order log log n. Okay, so this is the deterministic statement. And, and the proposition is telling us that actually uh, these random regular graphs or these Ramanujan graphs in general, um, that because the only thing that we need in order, this is kind of a red herring, this on G and D, what the proposition uh, actually needs is just what is just, it just looks at the spectrum. So if you have a Ramanujan graph or a weakly Ramanujan graph, in, in which case you have less control over your, uh, your little o here, but, but we don't care about that for now, uh, then Ramanujan graphs actually are the fastest possible for simple random walk for any LP. Uh, and, and here I, I chose, uh, I wrote P that is at least 2. Okay, going all the way to infinity. And we know, at least from, uh, from what we've seen in the past two classes, that G and D was <coughs> the fastest one for L1. So, and in fact, this will be, be true for any P from 1 to infinity. So these are kind of uh, uh, funny objects. Okay, the, the proof of this, of this uh, lower bound Actually, also the upper bound is immediate. The proof of the lower bound is very short. It's, it would be good to kind of uh, get us into gear before we, uh, before we uh, discuss how the actual proof of Ramanujan graphs for, L for P equals 1 works. So I'm going to do it uh, very quickly. So here's a, here's a proof. And the lower bound is, uh, is, is, uh, um, is es essentially um, exploiting the same old uh, connection between the cover tree and, and G, which is something that we've seen earlier uh, in this uh, course and also in Charles' uh, talks, goes as follows. So for, every, for the lower bound, this is what I'm going to start with, right? And I'm going to start doing it just for P equals 2. So any deregular graph, P equals 2. So what you can say is for every x in your graph, you want to understand what sum over y of, of pt xy squared is. Okay? And the reason is that pt x dot with respect to L2 of pi squared, okay? Um, well, what, what is that? Okay, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll write it like this. We have a sum over a, okay, let's, let's write it like this. Sum over x of mu of x. This is, I'll write it without writing it in, in terms of, of p to the t. I'll just write something that's true for any distribution mu. So for any distribution, for every dist probability distribution mu, if you just write this, Okay, so the relative density with respect to pi squared. Okay, this is this is my d pi. Okay, I'm right, this is a discrete space. So this is what we have here when I write mu replace p p to the t by mu. This, if we open it up, we get what? We get the square minus one. Okay, because <coughs> The cross term, again, the, the pi vanishes, so we have a, a minus 2 plus 1, which is a minus 1. Okay? Yes, fancy, right? Uh, so, so with this simple <coughs> observation, we see that, that this is the guy that we care about. Okay? But our pi, we, we also know what, what our pi is. It will just be uh, the uniform distribution. So let's look at what summation over x of mu squared is. So this is what I'm writing here. So summation over this x is actually this y. I hope that this is fine. <laughs> so summation over y of p, because of this is now becoming the source vertex for the walk. So pt xy squared, what is that? 
that is nothing but p 2t of xx. Okay, so these are the wonders of uh, reversibility. Okay, which, so this is, this just measures the probability of returning to the origin. We are in G, we are still not on, tree, on the tree. Returning to the origin in 2t steps. Okay, so now we can lower bound it by Q 2t of OO where this is random walk on the tree. Okay, now using the exact same connection. Okay, so it is just a lower bound, but definitely because the tree has the same labels for many vertices in G. So, so we, don't, we really don't need to go back to the root in order to revisit the same vertex multiple times, but certainly if we revisit the tree, uh, the tree is root, then we do go back to the origin. Okay, so, um, so Q transition kernel. Transition kernel um, of 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 R. We used this notation in the course. The script X on on T D. Okay, but okay, but what is this guy? But this guy. Okay, this is nothing but the probability, and you can now say that my O also looks like a zero. But this is a zero. Um, so the probability starting from zero that s t equals zero, where s is the appropriate one-dimensional biased reflected at zero random walk. Because now we are just forgetting that this is a tree, and we'll ju we just have this this biased random walk that that goes right. It goes to the right with probability d minus 1 over d and to the left with probability 1 over d and we reflect it at 0 because we don't go to the negative. So uh, this is just, this is nothing but the height, <coughs> the height of xt. So, um, okay, so this is known, okay, this guy. So this is equal to 2 rho squared. I'm writing a, a, a precise formula. because it's, it's nice that, that, that these things are known to this level of a precision. This is equality. Okay? And let's write what this actually means. This is asymptotically, if we are looking at, at t large, this behaves like rho to the 2t uh, Okay, so what do we care about? We care about this t to the minus 3 halves and about this rho to the 2t. Okay, so this means, if we go back to wha why we needed this, this means that if we look at pt x dot divided by pi dot minus 1, okay, L2 of pi, it's at least 2, um, Rho tilde, rho squared, I have a square root pi here. And now the important things, we have a rho to the 2t divided by t to the 3 halves times n. And the n comes from, from this ratio of pi okay, that we said, let's postpone that till later. Here we did it without the division by pi. So dividing by pi gives a factor of n. Okay, so, so now we see that in order to actually, to actually um, kill this n and bring our L2 of pi, our, our distance with respect uh, to, to, to L2 to be, I don't know, a half or close to zero, then we have to pay a, a factor of, we have to pay t. t should be at least one half. First of all, one half uh, log base one over rho of n. That's to kill the n, but we also have our t in the denominator, which we can kill with a, an extra sum c log log. Okay, so, uh, so that is the, the lower bound. It is trivial. And for the upper bound, we just want to use, um, I'm, I'm using this, uh, by the way, 
you may not realize this, but uh, one of the <laughs> But uh, one of my purposes in doing this exercise is to remind everyone uh, the expansions, the spectral expansions with respect to L2 distance, which we are going to use in the proof of the Ramanujan graph. So those of you who, are, uh, who, who find this uh, super elementary, bear with me uh, slightly longer. Um, so uh, uh, for, for the upper bound, well, um, all that you need to do is, is remind yourself um, Okay, remind yourself of, of, uh, of, of the fact that, uh, that we can just write, we can write the, the L2 distance as summation over, over i running from 2 all the way to n. Now we have something like this. F of this is something that we did write on the board last time. We have fi evaluated at x squared, and now we have lambda i divided by d to the power of 2t. This was a different uh, uh, formula for a different, uh, it was equality for, uh, for this distance. And now, if we look at it like this, then we see that in order to kill n together with something that is, if you know that all the lambdas are at most, uh, all, all these, these guys are at most rho, then you get essentially the same thing for Ramanujan, right? Our assumption for Ramanujan was that the absolute value of this guy is, is at most rho. Okay, so we get here something that looks like n times rho to the 2t, which is exactly matching this, this guy up to this log log correction. Okay, so that's why, why the, the Ramanujan ones achieve this equality. Okay. Um, so one, one last thing, um, yeah, okay, um, here, here's one last thing. So this is this formula, the fact that this equals n times Oh, uh, did I? I forgot the end. Uh, and um, yes. Um, well, we can. Okay, maybe maybe we'll give it a, as an exercise. There is. A, I I think I'll give it as an exercise. There is there is an addif a, an additional uh, way to see this lower bound, which is related to what Charles was talking about yesterday. Um, if you know if you don't want to look at the tree and want to immediately obtain a lower bound that matches this rho to the 2t times n, you can use the fact that, I mean, how, how did our upper bound work? It, it said, well, you have, um, you have uh, all your eigenvalues are, are essential, are at most rho, and, uh, and rho is enough to kill an n in time uh, it, well, it, it, rho squared is, is, a, is enough to kill, a, uh, to kill an n if, if you raise it to a power of t, which is a half log n. Okay, that's, that was the upper bound. The lower bound that you could say if you wa don't want to look at the tree just uses uh, Serre's theorem that tells you that not only do you have to have an eigenvalue close to rho, cl close to 2 root d minus 1, but there's a linear number of such eigenvalues. And if you know that there's a linear number of such eigenvalues, then, then you, have to, you have to kill an n with, with that rate. So, okay. Sorry, can I stop? Yes, but yeah. I'll give this, but, but if it's related to the exercise. No. Okay. Um, you've put here the L2 problem. Yes. The square above where you've looked at mu, but then you've not looked at the square below. Um, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Where? <laughs> so there's, shouldn't, shouldn't there be a minus one if you're looking for it to be close to zero? No, no, no. You're looking for this to be close to zero after the minus one. The one here is pi, essentially. Yeah. It's the. So but I mean, in the previous line, you you got a minus one. Yeah. The minus one. But if you're looking for the tail on the right hand side to be like approximately. It's I I I do. So what? what but there's it? no minus one on on, on the second line. Okay, so we, but you can add a minus one if, if you want. Uh, what do you I take t to make this other number approximately zero. 
or like a small cup. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so if t is small, then it's big, and you want to do it This is this is really simple. I'll I'll be happy to walk it through you uh, in the break. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so the well, you do need the minus, minus one, please. Yeah, but for these times, it, uh, that's why that's why I, I, I wrote it in kind of like a <laughs> in a, in a, in a faded uh, font. I, I didn't want I want to to look at the the at the term that multiplies n. Okay, so until you become the point, you could <laughs> the the question is so when you start with total variation mixing, you start with distance of one and you need to go to zero. When you talk about L2 mixing, you start with root n, and you need to go where? So you could say that you need to go to 1, but you could also say that you need to go to 10. And it would be the same, because uh, we, we know that there is, that there is a, a cutoff in these situations, because uh, there's a theorem by of course, and Chen that tells you that, that, that Yuval's condition, this uh, product criterion, is going to capture a cutoff for any LP for if P is larger than 1. However, we don't know where that cutoff is. But if we know that there's cutoff, then setting a, a constant is really it's the same for all of them. So, so if you choose 10 and you are happy that it's <laughs> OK. Um, OK, so this, the, the, the nutshell was, uh, the, the take home message from this was spectral analysis does not work because this guy which is our L2 mixing time. This is our L2 mixing time for G and D. We have it precisely. And we can do the same for any LP uh, larger than 2. And for between 1 and 2, you could, you could also calculate it. But, but these guys all miss the bound that we are after. What is the bound that we are after for L1? It was, I'll remind you, this was the formula that we got from G and D, right? So if you think that the Ramanujan graph in general should be like the random regular graph, then this is the bound that you're after. This looks kind of different. And uh, one of the exercises was it's a simple uh, calculus uh, exercise to show that for any d that is 3 and above, this guy, the, the leading order uh, constant before the log n here is strictly bigger than this one, as it has to be. OK, so, so as a method, um, it breaks down. So let's see what we can do. Um, okay, this is a picture of, uh, of the Ramanujan graphs and some, uh, some simulation that shows us. Uh, so this is actually simple random walk uh, and non, uh, in L1 and, and as opposed to L2. And you see that, that L1 and L2 look like this. So, uh, so the blue curve is the L1, and it mixes strictly before the L2 does. Okay, and this is the picture of of the generalization of this uh, proposition that I uh, that I wrote down that works for any p. So, for any p, it turns out that these Ramanujan graphs and also the the random regular graphs that that, that behave the same way they attain the fastest possible uh, mixing time. Okay, and it goes like, like this. Okay, but OK. Oh, and, and, that's, and that's the last one, I think. This is a, a simulation for, a, for, for LP, for just the LP distance on one family of, uh, of Ramanujan graphs, okay, how it kind of how it decays, and as you can see, you have uh, L1, and then fa much farther L2, and so on. Okay, so all of them take longer and longer to mix, and L, L infinity is to the far right. Okay, now this is the theorem that we want to show. We want to say that exactly what we had on GND also applies on a Ramanujan graph. Can you turn off some light? We'll see. Okay. Um, so this is the theorem that we want to show, but we also know that spectral analysis isn't good enough. Just uh, the, 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 the naive approach to, to spectral analysis to just write it down. Um, and we also know that our understanding of, of, of a general non-bipartite Ramanujan graph is, is limited. 
So we cannot do the tricks that we did in GND, which I'll remind you, the bottom line wa wa was you needed to know to estimate the size of the cut between every two balls of, uh, that, contain, that had volume root n. So two typical balls with volume root n, you wanted to know that they have the right number of edges between them, that it's essentially like the, the a poisson with fixed mean. If you knew that, then, then uh, you're in business, but otherwise you have nothing. Okay, so, uh, okay, so, so the solution in this case, let's keep this on the board for, for, uh, for a minute. The solution is simply to, um, to work with, with non-backtracking uh, walks instead. So as we did for, a, for the case of, a, of, of the proof of, of, of the walk in the, in the random regular graph, there we moved to non-backtracking random walks, even though you could have done, carried out the same proof uh, for the simple random walk, which we did in the, in the first paper. Um, here it turns out that the move to non-backtracking random walks is imperative. If, um, so for the sake of this spectral analysis. So uh, let's write, let's remind you that uh, A is the adjacency matrix of G and B is the adjacency matrix of the, of the non-backtracking walk. Let's just say the non-backtracking op operator. Um, which, which acts on directed edges. Okay, so acts on. Okay, and this acts on the vertices. Um, and uh, what we know about, uh, uh, what if, you, if you recall Charles' uh, talk from yesterday, um, there is this tight connection between the eigenvalues lambda 1 all the way to lambda n of simple random walk, or of A in this case, and the eigenvalues theta i, like this, uh, there, are, there, uh, there are dn eigenvalues, so d for the degree n for the number uh, of uh, vertices is the number of directed edges of B, and and it turns out that this uh, relation, maybe <coughs> I, I have a, a picture of it. Uh, let me jump for a second to this picture. Um, you see these two uh, circles, you see a circle uh, above there are two types of, uh, of actually of, of eigenvalue distributions. Now the eigenvalues are no longer uh, real, unfortunately, because this matrix is no longer normal, but you, <laughs> but you can still plot out the complex eigenvalues, and they sit over there uh, in the complex plane, and it turns out that for Ramanujan graphs, they are all exactly uh, with modulo root d minus 1. Exactly. Okay? I mean, there are trivial ones that are plus or minus 1. Let's ignore them. It's just like you have a trivial one for simple random walk that is d. For Ramanujan graphs, you have all of these eigenvalues. You have, let's say, 1 at d, and all the rest sit here at an interval, at an interval between plus and minus 2 root d minus 1. It turns out that through this relation that Charles uh, mentioned, all your complex eigenvalues, theta i, are going to be transported to, to, uh, to have exactly modulo root d minus 1 in the complex plane. Okay, so these are your thetas. They sit here, and you have, uh, you have the plus and minus 1, and you also have the d minus 1, which, is, which also comes from this d. Okay? So this is a, so this is what the picture looks like, and and why is that helpful? Well, uh, let's go back to the theorem above. Um, it is helpful for the following reason. Let's uh, imagine that our B was a normal operator, 
And we'd like to do exactly the same trick as, as we did before, which is to write down the L2 distance explicitly. Okay, what would we get? Well, we would get something like summation over i that is at least 2, okay, up to n. This is d times n. And uh, there is some contribution for the, for the eigenfunctions. I'm going to ignore it. Okay, we can ignore, uh, technically it's, it's not such a, you don't need to raise your eyebrows uh, that much. It's actually uh, <laughs> easy to, uh, to eliminate the eigenvalues if, for instance, you cared about just the uh, average starting position instead of the worst one, right? I mean, if you have something like this, if you have a summation over from uh, i going from uh, 2 to n of fi evaluated, this is your eigenfunction evaluated at x, your starting position, squared, and now you have some lambda to the i to the 2t. Okay, you have something like this. If I'm telling you that instead of this, you are now, um, you want to take 1 over n summation over x. So this is, uh, so this is, for every x you have the, the mixing time form x. So this is a quenched property. So we first draw the random environment, the graph. Now there are various points. Each of them has a mixing time. And probably they are all the same. They are all because, uh, because of uh, symmetry. It's not transitive. If, it's, if the graph was fixed and transitive, then this thing is exactly one. If it's, uh, otherwise, you can still say what, what it means to mix from an average starting position. If you do that, you can interchange these two sums. And then you use the fact that summation, what do you get? You get summation over x of fi of x squared, which by Parseval is 1. So this becomes a 1, and you are left with, a, with exactly what you need. So, so, um, so this is a cheap trick to uh, bypass uh, lack of understanding of eigenfunctions. But it turns out that, that in this situation of the problem, we actually, even without this, we can uh, go beyond eigenfunctions. This is not the main issue. We can, we can somehow uh, bypass the fact that we don't understand them. Okay, so I'm going to ignore them. Now, if we ignore them, what are we left with? Well, we have something that looks like summation over i of theta i divided by d minus 1 to the 2t. Okay, for the non-backtracking random walk. I'm now, I'm, I'm committing a, a serious uh, crime here by treating B as a normal operator. That is a huge, uh, a huge difference. But let's just see whether this gives the right intuition or not. So the degree of, uh, B was, was here just uh, a 0, 1 matrix. I put, uh, just, just the way Shal defined it, I wrote 1. Uh, from moving from x, y to y, z for such that these are two edges and z is, is not x and, and 0 otherwise. So this is a 0, 1 matrix. How many ways do I have to do this on a, on a d regular graph? d minus 1. So d minus 1 is, is the first eigenvalue, the trivial one. That's why this point is here. This is the Perron eigenvalue. And now what does this look like? Um, if I, I'm now in a situation, if you, if you trust my, uh, if you believe me that all the eigenvalues magically lined up uh, on this circle at radius root d minus 1, then here I'm going to write just n, well, do you want me to write n minus 1? <laughs> I can write an n minus 1 if you want. Okay. <laughs> um, what we have here is n times, um, so we write a, d minus, a root d minus 1 for, uh, for the modulo of this theta i. And we divide it by a d minus 1. And we raise the entire thing to the power of 2t, OK? Which is n d minus 1 to the minus t, OK? Which allows us to kill this n at time log base d minus 1 of n. n is, n is dn. OK, so we see that moving to 
the non-backtracking walk, of which the simple random walk is simply a marginal, it's just uh, the end, the end point, for instance, uh, by this exact same argument of the cover tree, right? Remember that for, the, for the, the, th that argument that related simple random walk to non-backtracking random walk was fine for any graph G. It didn't need to be random. So it always suffices to bound the, the mixing time of the non-backtracking random walk. And I'll remind you that that argument had a conclusion. Suppose you can show me that there is cutoff for non-backtracking random walk at some time L, at some time L, L for non-backtracking random walk implied a, the, the same upper bound, just an upper bound on mixing of at times d over d minus 2 times l for simple random walk, plus there was some error, okay, some plus order root l error. Okay, so that was the, the reduction. So if we know that we can put in log d minus 1 of dn as an upper bound, then we get our d over d minus 2 upper bound for the theorem, which is exactly what we're after. And the lower bound is the same. The lower bound was also uh, fine for any deterministic graph. It was just uh, relying on how fast it takes you to actually see the vertices of any graph with even doesn't have to be regular. It has to be maximum degree d. You can't see all the vertices before that time. So, but here it's the L2 uh, mixing time here for the non Ah, but that's an upper bound on the L1. So what you have, good question. Uh, so what you have here is that the non-backtracking non random walk had the same lower bound of covering, of, of kind of re seeing all the vertices. So th what this calculation, that is of course erroneous because we said that it's normal, but what this cal calculation would say is that that here is the L2 point in time where you mix, okay? This is this <coughs> log d minus 1 over of n, of dn, it doesn't really matter, and for non-backtracking. And here is L1 lower bound for non-backtracking. So actually, the non-backtracking walk has the same cutoff location for both L1 and L2 as opposed to simple random walk where they are shifted apart. So you move to non-backtracking random walk and they glue to one another. And, but for the sake of simple random walk, you just needed the upper bound. Okay, so, uh, so, so your question actually uh, uh, raises a point that I didn't say, that actually this would also show, not only would, would give us cutoff for simple random walk at, that, at, the time, at the rescale time, but also cutoff for the non-backtracking random walk and then at, at, at the faster time, okay? Both with L1 and L2 at the same location. Okay, um, okay, but this, uh, so, uh, so, so this operator is, operator is not normal, but uh, it turns out that one can uh, bypass that uh, technicality. And we'll see that uh, in a second. But before we do so, let's just uh, see what one can uh, achieve once you know that, that, for instance, that the L1 mixing time is a time log d minus 1 over n times a. Well, that let's, once you know, for instance, that the non-backtracking walk has cut off at this t. Okay? So we know that if we do a non-backtracking random walk now on, on, the gra on a Ramanujan graph, if we believe that this, uh, that this argument can be made, uh, can be corrected, has, should have cut off at this location. Well, what does that mean? This is the, actually the time that it takes us to see, the ver to see all the directed edges. Okay? And essentially at that time we mix. So that must mean that the distance, and this is worst case starting position. So it means in particular that almost all vertices should have that distance from us. I mean, we know that almost all vertices are at least that far. If there was a constant fraction that was farther, then it would mean that the total variation distance would, would be less than one, because that would be a distinguishing statistic. So here is where we use the fact that L1 really has uh, a physical interpretation as opposed to a, an analytical or spectral interpretation. From L1, we can read distinguishing statistics. So it tells us various things, such as this one, okay? So 
Almost all vertices are at that distance from, uh, from the origin. Um, uh, which, uh, and, and you can say, uh, you can say more things. Uh, okay, so for instance, the diameter, I won't go into all of them. The diameter one, for instance, you can say that the diameter is at most two, this, this comment from below. How do you know that the diameter is two? Well, from one vertex, you see almost all vertices at distance one times log d minus one over, over n. Okay, so from any two vertices, uh, the, the s it suffices that you see more than a half at distance one log d, d minus one over n, and there's a, a, there has to be a path between them of length two times log d minus one over n. Of n. So this is trivial. And actually you can say more things. For instance, you know that there is, a, you use the fact that, that, uh, that, that this is a non-backtracking walk. And that means that you can, I can say, well, I don't want you to just reach z here, or most z's, in a, in, in a path. But I want you to reach z here in a path that uses, that starts with this edge and is non-backtracking. And th that seems kind of like a, okay, what's the big difference? But for instance, these Ramanujan graphs, they have a huge girth. Okay, so some of these constructions have a girth that is, that, uh, that, that is, you know, two-thirds log base d minus one of n. Okay, for instance. So if I force you to go through a, s a specific side, Suppose that the shortest path went through one of the other neighbors f from W. In order to actually get to W, because you can't turn around, you have to somehow complete a cycle, and the cycle will cost you a macroscopic amount of time. Okay, so a huge amount. But actually, it turns out that there's such a wealth of paths that you can always get from, a, a, from any di direction that you want to any direction that you want to get uh, to Z from. Anyway, and there are various other statements. In, in the paper, we listed uh, various more complicated uh, uh, corollaries. OK, so, um, so the key to, to the proof, I think, so we, we started this proof actually after seeing Charles' paper. Because in Charles' paper from 2015, the one that we talked about yesterday, he somehow he analyzes the non-backtracking random walks uh, in a way that really looked like, in order to understand, to show that it's, that it's weakly Ramanujan, in a way that really seemed close to what we need, we need to somehow do exactly the opposite, use the fact that it's weakly Ramanujan to somehow count the non-backtracking random walks, and then it kind of seemed like, well, this, this thing has to, has to give you the uh, proper uh, control. And this slide summarizes what we said, that just a simple uh, spectral analysis fails. Um, and this picture uh, shows you this. Uh, you see that how the L1 and L2 glue on the non-backtracking side, and don't on the on the uh, for the simple random. Uh, and uh, the so for simple, you have L1 and L2 differ, and for non-backtracking, they glue each other. Uh, okay. So so two quick things. First, uh, the reason that that all the eigenvalues are uh, on this disk at radius root d minus 1. That's an old fact. It's a result of Hashimoto in 89. It uses the Ihara zeta function. So, and, and, and Charles also referred to it as Bass's formula. Bass's formula gives also, uh, also implies it, uh, and it and applies to not necessarily general, uh, regular graphs. Uh, so, so he wrote uh, the Bass Ihara uh, formula. And it tells you that that whenever you have an eigenvalue lambda, that eigenvalue gives rise to, of, of A, it gives rise to two eigenvalues, theta 1 and theta 2, of B. Okay? And then B has many more, more uh, states. It has dn as opposed to 2n the two that I just counted. But all of these uh, d minus 2 times n are trivial eigenvalues. These are these plus and minus ones that you get from, you have various degrees of freedom. And this is something that uh, I'm going to dedicate one of the exercises to today. Um, OK, so, uh, so one, uh, one little calculation that Charles did yesterday, and he did it a little quick, 
quickly, uh, and I want to do it again just because um, it's kind of a, it's, it's, I think it's important to, to, to bear in mind, uh, which is why, uh, how you can actually see that, that, that every lambda gives rise to two such thetas. Okay, so, so suppose that A F equals lambda F, okay? And suppose that theta solves this equation. It's the root of this quadratic. <coughs> okay. Then I want to convince you that actually you can write down an eigenvalue of, of, uh, of B that, that matches theta. Okay? So uh, all the way, uh, also, by the way, uh, if, you, if you look at, at this formula, okay, maybe we'll write it very, very quickly. So, so this is the solution, right? This is the solution of a quadratic minus d minus 1. This is the solution of this quadratic equation. <coughs> Notice that if lambda is less than 2 root d minus 1, that's, that's exactly when this discriminant becomes negative. Okay? Then we have a lambda over 2 plus i times, okay, so we have plus, in that situation, we'll have a plus i root d minus 1 minus lambda squared, or, a pl or minus that thing. And the modulo, so we have, we'll, we'll end up with having a theta and a theta conjugate. Okay? Right? In that situation, when lambda is less than uh, 2 root d minus 1. And what is the, the absolute value? What is the modulo? Well, we'll see that it's lambda over 2 squared minus this squared. The lambda over 2 squared cancels, and we're left with a root with, with, a, with a d minus 1. This is for, for the square. So the modulo is root of that. Right? So, this so if you believe that theta that solves this quadratic is uh, that's, that's all the non-trivial eigenvalues of Rb, then you immediately see that being Ramanujan implies that all of them have to be on this circle in C. Mean that, uh, does it mean that uh, B has uh, at most two and uh, distinct eigenvalues? No. This means, well, it has, uh, it has, it has at most 2n plus 3. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's the trivia. It has at most 2n distinct non-trivial eigenvalues. There are the 1s minus 1s and d minus 1 that you can immediately write down. Okay, so so the actually, uh, slightly less than that, because the d minus 1 and one, one of the 1 copies come from plugging in lambda equals d. Right? If you solve lambda, uh, if you can see that if you put in lambda equals d, then d minus 1. And okay, so, and the, and the rest, uh, n minus 1 eigenvalues, they can give uh, uh, rise to, uh, to non-trivial eigenvalues on the circle. Okay, so uh, how do you see this, uh, uh, this, that, that this uh, quadratic is the right thing to look at? All that you need to do is to define the following. I'll, I'll say that g of x, y, this is a directed edge, so I'm defining an eigenfunction explicitly. It's just theta f y minus f x. This is it. Okay. Now I need. I'll just verify very quickly that this is a, a, an eigenfunction. So what is b times g of x y? What do I need to do? I'm summing over z such that y z is an edge, non-directed, just a simple edge. Okay, it doesn't matter. And and I want z to not be x. This is, a, this is where the operator B would send x, y, okay? to an edge y, z, such that z is not x. Okay? And now, what do I need to, to do to that one? Well, I need to apply g on y, z. So it is theta of f, z minus f, y. Right? This is g of y, z. Okay, um, so what is that? What we have here is exactly theta times a f of y 
Okay, so minus fx minus d minus 1 of fy. Because, look, fy gets counted as many times as we have z's. We have exactly d minus 1 z's. Because, because it's irregular, it's, it's, the, it's the out degree of, of this b operator. It's the Perron eigenvalue. So this d minus 1 f of y is, uh, just, is just by the regularity of b. And now we're left with this guy. So if we had counted all the z's, including x, this is exactly like applying the adjacency operator, okay? which is af of, of y and multiplying it by, by, a, by a theta. Because it would say, look at all the neighbors of y and apply f over them. But we forgot 1. We, we left out x. So minus f of x. Okay? And now, this rises. Now we'll use the fact that AF is lambda F, and we have here theta lambda minus D minus 1 multiplies our F of Y minus theta F of X. I rearranged it a little. Okay, I took the theta FX out. So I use the fact that that AF equals lambda F, and I have that. And, and now I want to use the, the solution of the solution of the quadratic to say that this is nothing more than theta of GXY. Okay? Because uh, okay, you just you just see that you have here exactly. Okay, this, this, this is the point where you just plug in the fact that theta lambda minus d minus 1 uh, is exactly theta lambda is exactly theta squared. Okay, so this is theta, squ theta squared because of the solution to the quadratic. So we have theta squared fy minus theta fx, which is exactly theta times the g th that we started with. Okay, so Charles did it very quickly <laughs> yesterday on the board, uh, uh, roughly, and uh, and now we see that ex we see exactly where these these eigenvalues come from, and and the problem uh, that we still need to to work with is the fact that this operator is not normal. So the fact that we have exactly the right kind of control over the thetas, uh, it doesn't really care about it. I mean, it doesn't let us work with it the way that we want to. Okay, so, so for this, uh, and th that was the, 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 the bit that, that required uh, some delicate treatment in that paper, we needed to decompose the operator and show that even though it's not normal, it has, it, it's decomposable into two by two blocks. Okay, so it is unitarily similar to a block diagonal matrix whose block sizes are just two. Okay? So even though they are not one, so it's not a diagonal matrix, they are just two by two. And they look like this. The theta two and theta two prime are, in the case of Ramanujan graphs, going to be a, a, a value and, and its conjugate, its complex conjugate. Just like we saw here, the solutions to this quadratic equation. Otherwise, they would, so in the, in the real case, in the, in the Ramanujan, in the non-Ramanujan case, uh, then you have two real values that, uh, that are not, okay, so, that, that are marked here as, as a theta 2 and theta 2 prime. But they still come from being two, the two roots of, uh, of the same quadratic equation coming from the same lambda. Okay, so these can have lots of multiplicities, and that's what made the proof uh, more delicate. Specifically, in the Ramanujan construction that I showed pictures of, uh, eigenvalue multiplicities are as high as n to the 1 third. So, uh, like if all the eigenvalues were different, then there would be some easy, easier ways to work around the fact that you can somehow nearly diagonalize. And they're not, but you can still, um, you can still uh, carry through. Uh, so with this uh, formula, uh, all that remains is there's still the business of the eigenfunctions, which I'm uh, again... Uh, which I again want to ignore. <coughs> ah. But the only thing that one needs to, to, 
to now notice is that if you have a 2 by 2 matrix that looks like this, I'll put here a theta and a theta prime, 0, and I'll write here alpha, just like we have over there. And we raise it to the power of t. Okay? So in the spectral decomposition, so you have your, your lambdas, then you raise your matrix to the power uh, t, and the lambdas just rise to lambda to the power of t, and then you square it when you do this, uh, this Parseval. But, uh, but, but, uh, but now we have a 2 by 2 matrix, but it is still easy to see what's going on. So here we have a theta to the t, here we have a theta prime to the t, okay, 0 is 0, and here we have something that looks like, I'll call it gamma, and gamma, I'll call it gamma sub t. Gamma is just this sum, right? This is well known. Okay, so it's uh, theta to the uh, j, theta prime to the t minus 1 minus j. This is all, right? So, uh, so your gamma t, this value of gamma t, it's at most alpha times t times theta to the t minus 1. Okay, so instead of just sustaining as above, above I, 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 we had, let's replace this. <coughs> above, we sustained, uh, which is now below, we sustained something like a, like, like a value of, of theta to the 2t. Okay? So we had the theta to the 2t and then we squared it. Now there's an extra term that comes in from this off-diagonal entry. But, and, and this extra term is actually becoming dominant because it has an extra t in it. So what? So what we get, instead of getting this, we'll get instead constant. This is what we had before. Instead, instead of getting, this is what we had before. And instead, we have another t squared. This is a minus. Okay? D minus 1, 2 minus, exactly what we had before. This comes from the gamma squared. Okay? So, okay. So we need to take t to be the same thing plus a log log to kill this t squared. And that's it. You get this by taking the trace of the power of the operator? Uh, you could, uh, well, there are the eigenfunctions to get rid of, but yes. Um, okay, so, uh, so this essentially uh, concludes this proof. Okay. Now, uh, in the little time that remains, uh, I want to give you an, an overview, an overview, a very rough overview of, of why we needed to have yet a third proof of, of cutoff for, uh, for GND. Because uh, two sounds like enough. <laughs> uh, and the point in having, OK, let's, this is the calculation that we just did. The point in, in having the third proof is to treat with non-regular random graphs. And if the graphs are non-regular, then this completely destroys the spectral proof. And it also makes the original proof, uh, well, it, it, it also seriously damages the original one. But non-regular random graphs are, uh, uh, are um, associated with fascinating uh, features, and one of which I highlighted in this slide. Uh, it turns out that the, act, that the thing that plays the key role in understanding what the mixing time is on a graph that is, let's say, not three regular, but half the degrees are three and half are four. What do you do? Already from this exploration process that we saw, this BFS, working with the configuration model, we saw that, that we developed the neighborhood of a vertex, and it was essentially like a, a D regular tree, right? Now, in, this, in, in the new situation, we can do exactly the same thing, and now the neighborhood of a vertex will no longer be D regular, it, but every time we just sample the degree from one of the remaining half edges. A half edge, a uniform one, would come along, and it, it will bring all its friends with it. Okay? So this would give 
a Poisson gold uh, a, a, a Poisson Golden Watson tree. Okay, and uh, or or for in, in the case of uh, of GNP or not Poisson but some other Golden Watson tree with a with a degree distribution z that in the case of let's say half degree three half degree four is not really half half two and half three, it would be the size biased version of this variable because if a guy has many, many half edges, you are more likely to choose it and it will bring then all of its friends as the, as the children. And this is well known. Okay, so as I was saying, the thing that plays a role is then the entropy of a random walk on the Galton Watson tree. So the, the degree sequence will describe in the obvious way, using this uh, size biased uh, transition, will describe a, a, a distribution, an offspring distribution that I will call Z. And now we are forgetting about the random graph. We just have Z, and we picture this infinite tree. Okay, this uh, this infinite uh, Galton Watson tree. And we recall that when we had this cover map argument and we have the and everything was d regular then what was the cutoff time for the non backtracking random walk for instance we wanted to reach level which was log base d minus 1 of n right we want to reach a level where we would see n vertices and that marked the onset of mixing and simple random walk was just a time delay over this alternatively i could say that this is the time where your distribution of the non-backtracking random walk, okay, let's look at its entropy. At first, you have a point mass. Then it is uniform on, on uh, d minus 1 points, and then it's uniform over d minus 1 squared points. Okay, so it grows. The entropy is exactly growing according, it, it, is, it is just uniform over, over the size of the layer, which is d minus 1 to the k at distance k. So this is the rate of, of growth of the entropy, and you are waiting for this to become uh, just completely uniform. Okay, you are wait. So the time that you need to wait is exactly that. This is for the simple ra for the non-backtracking random walk, and you could say the same for the simple random walk. It has a delay, but it is essentially the same thing by exactly this analogy between non-backtracking random walk and simple random walk. And the simple random walk is nothing more than once you know the distance on the cover tree then it is just non-backtracking random walk. Okay, so it turns out that this entropy is the thing to look at if you don't have a regular setup anymore, but it's instead now just, just uh, some offspring distribution, uh, offspring variable z. So I write this hx on the top left, and I'm telling you, uh, well, now if you don't, if you, for instance, this is your the first, you were not listening the entire week, and all of a sudden you looked at this slide, okay? <laughs> then uh, you, you consider a biased random walk on a Galton Watson tree, and you can define the distribution, you can understand, look at the distribution SRWT, which is just the distribution of random walk after t steps on this tree, and count its entropy just like Yuval defined in the previous uh, class. SRWT standing for? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the fact that this uh, limit exists is a non-deterministic constant almost surely requires proof. But uh, let's, uh, let's uh, take a leap of faith here. The fact that these constants are well-defined and are non-random is, uh, is known. And I'm asking what can you say about the relation between these uh, three constants? Uh, one of the, equality, of the inequalities is trivial. We know the ratio, actually I can tell you already, we know the ratio between the top two, but we don't know the other two inequalities in this generality. So for instance, if z has, uh, we know, uh, I'll say at the end what we know, but so in this generality, if z is at least, is, can, can, if t, z can take the value one with positive probability, we have a conjecture, but we don't know it. And it's a very basic, a uh, seemingly naive question, right? It is just the growth rate of entropy. Oh, that's loop erased. Um, loop erased, I just mean, this is a tree, so understanding loop erased is very easy. What you have here, uh, what you have on the left is just simple random walk, okay? It goes up and then goes down somewhere else. 
Uh, the only loops on the tree are the trivial ones. So the loop erased is just the trace of the walk where you eliminate all the, the trivial going back and forth. So instead of the non-backtracking did not allow you to, to go back and forth. So the non-backtracking is a ray. However, it is a very simple ray. It is one where you know exactly that if you have now k children, then you go to each of them with probability 1 over k. Loop erased also looks like a ray, but it assumes the, the, the harmonic distribution over these. It works like the simple random walk would, but then you eliminate all of these. Actually, uh, ex ex these, these guys have an exponentially decaying uh, tail, but, but, but the fact that the walk can actually Oh, okay. Th this, this object is, uh, is uh, extremely more complicated than just the non-backtracking random walk. Uh, okay, so, um, so here's, a, here's a what I was saying. Formally, you see that Hx, this growth of entropy, that's the key parameter for simple random walk on a graph with the degree sequence. Okay, so you have a random graph with some degree sequence. You define a random variable z, that is the size biased distribution that I mentioned, that has the size biased distribution. And now the growth of entropy on the corresponding Galton Watson tree dictates when mixing should occur. Okay, both for simple and for non backtracking random walk. Uh, and, um, and, okay, a. Uh, the fact that, so for number tracking random walk, this HY, because you can write it explicitly, because you know exactly the growth of entropy, because the probability to visit a vertex is nothing more. So if you have here degree, if you have D1 children here, D2, D3, and so on, the probability to visit this guy is just 1 over D1, 1 over D2, and so on, right? Because you choose exactly one of the children with equal probability. Now, these, this is z1, let's write it like that. Now it's, it's, it's a random guy, z3 and so on. So, so z1, z2, z3 and so on. But this is a Galton Watson tree. So the z's are independent. Okay, so, so if I want to understand what this probability is, behaves like, I'll take a log. Okay, and now if uh, I, uh, I know that, the, that I just. I'm summing log of zi's that are iid, and I have a central limit theorem. Okay, so the growth, I'm trying to say that the, the growth rate of this guy is nothing more than the expectation of log z. That's the rate at which entropy grows for a non-backtracking random walk. And I should say that Nikolai allowed me to go faster. <laughs> so you are discussing this, right? This is a, a, an infinite ah. The z was at least one. If you don't have, uh, if it can have leaves, then you need to define the non-backtracking walk to go up maybe and then continue. And it should be true still, but then I can't, it's, then the proof is even. <laughs> but it should still, you could still say that uh, stay something like this uh, um, and, 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 and ask what the relation between the corresponding parameters is. So whenever you are stuck, you have to go to your parent and then continue. Okay, anyway, uh, so, uh, so expectation of log z will, will, will be this h y. Okay, and, and, uh, and Justin and Anna Benamou had a proof of the second statement using a different uh, argument. Uh, and then you'll, if you open their paper, you'll see expectation of log z. Uh, and, they have a, and, and they have an argument that, that also walks through this uh, exposing a, a, like a tree from a left, a tree from a right, but then there, are, there is some, uh, you, you need, this is, becomes uh, delicate and they use some exchange, exchangeable pairs technique. It's, it's, it's very nice. It's going to appear soon, or it just appeared in uh, analysis of probability. Um, in order to get the simple random walk uh, case, um, the fact that the walk can go back and go uh, and somehow it seemed, it, you'd think that it wants to go forward, but actually then go, this was all part of some detour, then goes back and, and chooses an, an, another path. And, and the fact that we do not really understand what the support is of random walk on a, on a Galton-Watson tree, 
I mean, we, we understand, but we have just a, we, the, 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 there is understanding, but it is limited, um, meant that an entirely new approach had to be drafted to, uh, for, at least in our paper, for, for simple random walk. Um, we also did non-backtracking with, with uh, trees from the left and right. Mm -hmm. um, and, okay, I'll, uh, what I'll do, I'll, I'll show you one quick thing because we are running out of time, uh, the picture on the top shows you, for instance, the distribution of simple random walk on, a, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, five, or maybe six levels of a Golton Watson tree with a distribution that is half, half, either one or three. The fantastic idea of plotting the, um, the fantastic idea of plotting the histogram above the tree is Nicolas, uh, that, that appeared in a paper of uh, Nicolas and uh, Jean-Francois. Which, which I, I stole the idea from the book. Uh, oh, it's, it's such a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, and, and, that, and, and, that's, uh, a, a, and that paper uh, discussed, uh, so again, you, ha you, you want to understand how so I mentioned criticality uh, then, but um, but, but this picture is to show you that, that this quantity D that was, uh, uh, whose, and the fact that WT over T converges almost surely to this quantity, WT is this log, this is exactly, this is a, an equivalent formulation for, uh, for giving it in terms of the entropy, goes back to the, to the uh, famous paper by uh, Rust, Robin, and Yuval from 95. Um, and, and, and we, for instance, in this paper had to get some quantitative uh, rate of convergence, replacing this, uh, this arrow of uh, almost sure convergence, but we needed to get something about the fact that it behaves, essentially that the variance has order t. Okay, so not just that, uh, that the expectation is, uh, is dt and that you converge almost surely, but that you have a variance of t. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so I want to finish uh, with two things. Okay, let me hide this, uh, put, put, a, put, put this picture here. Um, I want to, to, to divide the, the next five minutes and then we'll finish into two parts. In the first, I will tell you what it is that we actually did in order to handle this case and why and how to actually, uh, and, and that would be very easy because I'm going to give you such a, a high level sketch that it would only take a minute. Uh, and the second is to understand the phenomena that is captured by these pictures, which is something that, that is kind of a, a take-home uh, message in, in the regular as opposed to non-regular world. Uh, the idea, we already discussed this expa exposing a tree from the left, exposing a tree from the right. The idea here is to, to say that when you are doing a, a, a simple random walk, on a Galton Watson tree, this dimension that was uh, mentioned in the previous uh, slide that captures the, the rate at which entropy grows tells you that even though the boundary of, uh, of this tree grows like the branching number, it grows like the expectation of, of z to the power of, uh, of k at level k, actually, what does this entropy growth rate mean? It, the, the, it means that the simple random walk, well, we, we phrase it in terms of the loop erased random walk, which is simple random walk when, it stop, when you erase all the, sim the, the simple uh, the trivial loops and you looked at it at distance k. It means that simple random walk at distance k was confined to an exponentially small segment of, the, of level k. So instead of growing like expectation of z to the k, it grew like some d to the k, and d was strictly less than expectation of z. Okay, so it does go exponentially, but with a different base, uh, and, and, and that makes it exponentially uh, small in terms of that level. Okay, so... Um, so what does that mean, and how to actually... Buy, uh, Make, make a proof that, that allows you to understand when mixing occurs. 
First of all, it accounts for this picture here, because uh, how, how did we discuss what the diameter was or what the typical distance in the graph was? We said, expose the tree until you see all the vertices. I mean, that was uh, one of the exercises when we said, calculate the typical distance between vertices and then also do it with exponential ones. It's essentially you do a, a breadth first search and you wait until this tree grows such that you see n vertices as the leaves, essentially. And that, that gives you the, the typical distance in, in a random uh, graph. Okay, so, so in order to do that, since expectation of z is bigger than the actually the, the, the growth of, of this segment to which simple random walk is confined to, we can think of it as if simple random walk, so the tree grows very fast, but simple random walk has its own little tree and it grows at a slower rate. So this vertex x is going to see all the vertices in the graph, let's say here, that's where you, you have n vertices. And this dictates the typical distance. So when Duret had his picture of what the distance between the origin and, and the walk is, the picture would still look like that, exactly as in Duret's paper with uh, Nathaniel Berestiki. And he, you could say, well, as soon as it stabilizes, that's when I have mixing. This is a very natural marginal. This is what we started the first class with. This is what started uh, uh, this, this conjecture of Duret from 07. If you look at that point, if you look just at this marginal of the distance, you'll see that it stabilizes exactly at the location at log base expectation of z of n. And that is easy. However, at that point, simple random walk will still be confined to a smaller, to a polynomial. I mean, it's exponentially smaller, uh, so to some polynomial strictly less than, uh, with exponents strictly less than one. And this, we have a formula for it, but we don't really know to write it down. I can't tell you immediately what, what, what it is for, uh, for, for uh, even a distribution on two points. Have to run some uh, numerical uh, process to approximate it. Anyway, so it will be confined here. And in order for the entropy to actually become to go to log n so that you are uniform over all the vertices, you have to wait longer until this guy becomes bigger. And that is why on the irregular uh, graph case, you see the blue curve that is the mixing time one. It starts at one. It has cut off, but macroscopically later. Whereas on the regular case, both happen exactly the same time. Okay. Um, so, uh, so uh, I I think that uh, that that in order to un to to understand uh, just uh, this one minute uh, overview, all you need to think is that uh, about is that in order to do that we want to essentially explore the tree just like we did before. Only the the proof says explore only the parts of the graph that the walk is likely to go to. You can somehow, already by exposing the tree, you can see, ah, this part of the tree already looks like the walk is not going to visit there. So I'll stop exploration here. Because if you just explore a BFS and wait until you mix, then you'll run out of vertices and the tree approximation is going to die. It's very bad. We keep wanting to have lots of, of spare vertices so that the tree pro approximation would, would, would be accurate. So you are careful to only explore the really heavy part of the distribution. And, uh, and you can do that um, and, and somehow explore as you go along. And, and then as soon as you know that, you are, that, that your entropy is not too big towards the end, uh, you know that you are on a subset of the vertices. Uh, and maybe the walk escaped this tree, so that's a bad event. But if, if it still got confined to the popular part of where it should be, then most vertices here don't have a, a, a large weight. And there's an end game argument that uses the, the spectrum, which we won't get to. But that's what I meant by a hybrid. We have a combinatorial part w w which somehow understands the distribution of the walk on the graph. It bounds the, the maximum weight of a vertex. And then we say, okay, at this point, we punt. And the punt 
is to use the spectrum to say that this is an expander and say that if the maximum weight of a vertex is, let's say, at most n to the epsilon over n, so we are off by a factor of n to the epsilon compared to the stationary distribution, then the time that it will take us to kill this with the, spectra, with, with the spectral gap is log of that to some constant uh, basis, which is like epsilon log n for epsilon that is little o of 1. And then we, we, we do this in the, we are more careful to get the right uh, window. So this would actually be e to the root log n. And then when you take a log, you get the, the root log n that you want. But, but these are details. Um, OK, so I think uh, with that, I'll, uh, I, I'll, I said everything that I wanted to say. I'll just show you the answers to these inequalities that I wanted, that, that I said that we don't fully know. Uh, so this is in, in this, this paper we posted on Monday or on Saturday or on Saturday of this week. Uh, and so we know the left inequality is true if z is at least 2. We don't, if you allow some probability for z equals 1, should also be true. We don't know it. <laughs> um, and we don't know the right inequality at all. But it should also be true. Okay, nu is the speed of random walk. This uh, the the Hausdorff dimension that wa th that was the scary formula from the previous uh, slide. Um, so uh, yeah, so I think I'm I'm done. Ex at the in the exercise session, I'll start by solving this uh, this uh, distance problem with exponential ones, and then I'll I'll give you handouts of problems that will solve outside, like Charles' idea. It was very nice, uh, and then I'll walk between you to somehow. Uh, so we'll start with like 10 minutes of just uh, or fi five to go through that uh, that one exercise, and then uh, and then we'll do the handouts outside. Thank you.